So, uh, we've been talking about what it's like to live with, to work with, to socialise with people who never ever seem to listen. And we've been very honest in saying that there are people in each of our lives who are enormously frustrating to us because no matter how often we say it, they never seem to hear it. And over the long frustrating months and years that we've been dealing with this situation, it feels very much like every time we talk to them, we're talking to a brick wall. And over the last few Sundays in church, I've suggested that instead of talking to them, you should make more of an effort to listen to them. Instead of selfishly telling them again and again what you are looking for, you should instead selflessly pay attention to what they're looking for, to what they want, to what they need, to how they feel. And I showed you, theologically and scientifically, how the act of listening, deep careful listening, is often a way around the brick wall that exists between you and them. Now, that was all brilliant. But this morning, I want to balance everything I've said by telling you the complete opposite. Because sometimes, some people, in certain situations, in certain seasons of their life, frankly, are toxic. They are nothing more than stressors who will keep you from enjoying the full, joyful life that you wish to have for yourself and that God wishes for you to have. And you absolutely should not waste any time listening to those people. You're glad you came this morning already, aren't you? <laughs> so these are the people. This is who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people who drain you, who exhaust you, who frustrate you, who never seem tired of making withdrawals from your life, but never ever want to put a deposit into your life. And the funny thing is, you can be really good at uh, baby-proofing your house, at rust-proofing your car, at water-proofing your watch, but it's very difficult to protect yourself against the people who take, 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 and take, but never t want to give. And they never tire of the taking. So this morning that's who I want to talk about. And the first thing that I want to say to you as a Christian person is that it is okay. That is, it is biblically permissible for you as a Christian to be fully aware of who the takers are. So that you can respond properly to the way that they are. So have a look at this rather unusual sentence uh, on the screen. This comes from a wonderful part of the Bible called the letter of St. Paul to Timothy. So as you know, Paul is the older, wiser apostle. He's been there, he's done that. Timothy is his young apprentice. And in this particular sentence, Paul makes one of those delicious off-the-cuff remarks that gives us... Uh, uh, a rare insight into the kind of person he was and some of the things he sometimes thought. So writing to his younger friend, he says, Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. He went there to buy 101 dogs. <laughs> Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful in my ministry. Interesting. I sent Tychius to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. That's interesting. Then he says, look at this, Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. So what you see here in this unusual and in some respects unnecessary sentence in the Bible is Christianity's foremost proponent, 
doing something rather unseemly. He is saying, I just want you to know that there are people in my life who are useful to me. There are other people in my life who are useless to me. And there are other people still who are harmful to me. And the reason he talks in these categorical terms is because he wants his younger, and I suspect naiver friend, naiver, uh, naiver, is that a word? No? no? Oh, you're, you're pretty clear on that. His more naive friend, is that better? He, wa he wants his more naive friend, Timothy, to know the difference between these people. He wants his friend Timothy to look at everyone in his life and say, hey, I want you to know who's who. Because not everyone in your life is the same. And because not everyone in your life is the same, you need to treat everyone differently. Some people are useful, some people are useless, and some people are downright harmful. And okay, let's just say what we're all thinking. That sounds a wee bit mercenary, doesn't it? That sounds a wee bit unchristian, in fact. To speak as though people in your life should be divided into assets and liabilities. But as uncouth as it is, there is, I would suggest, value to you in knowing who is who. Because if you are surrounded by people who take from you all the time, and if everyone in your life is taking from you, then what do you think is going to happen to you? You're going to get drained. You're going to get taken. That's how it is. Some people take from you. Some people give to you. And if the takers exceed the givers, you are going to become emotionally, and by extension physically, wrecked. So let's do a quick test. I did this with myself this week, so this is for you. Think about people in your life. Think about that person you've already been thinking about this morning. Ask yourself these questions. Every time you get together with them, do they complain? Like, like everyone complains, but is it always like that? In their conversations with you, do they always want to come across as, as a victim? Are they always a victim? Is everything, in effect, trying to get you to feel sorry for them? Are they really good at acting hurt when things don't go their way? This is important. Do they ever try to make you feel guilty? Like, when you've already taken ten phone calls from them that day, on phone call number eleven, when you're kind of short with them, do they try and load guilt onto you for that? When you see their, their name on your phone, do you groan inwardly? Oh. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Yes. <clears throat> Sometimes your gut is wrong. Like when it tells you to eat a second donut, your gut is wrong. But sometimes your gut feelings are right. Sometimes your intuitions bang on. When you see someone's name in your phone and you groan inwardly, what's that saying to you? Maybe you should be listening. Do you ever feel like telling that person to just toughen up and deal with it? If you're in a relationship with someone like that and is like that all the time, you might be in trouble. Now the good thing about this is that when you label a relationship correctly, you then empower yourself to respond to it appropriately. For example, if you have a friend who's going through a hard time at the moment, you know that when that friend asks you to get together for a coffee, the chances are during that coffee, they're going to be drawing from you and you're going to be giving to them. And that's okay. That's okay, isn't it? That's absolutely fine. 
In this situation, you know very well that this particular coffee with this particular friend in this particular season of their life is going to be all about you supporting them. Nothing wrong with that. That's Christian. That's, that's human. That's what you do. You're going to be listening to them. You're going to be encouraging them. And you're going to be supporting them. So when you know that, you go into that coffee with that friend in that situation, being fully aware of that's exactly how it's going to be. But if you go into that coffee with that friend in that situation, thinking that it's not going to be about that, thinking that they're going to be listening to you, and they're going to be supporting you, and they're going to be encouraging you, then you're going into that coffee with unrealistic expectations. And when you have unrealistic expectations, you end up with deep frustrations. And that's good to know. But, what if all your relationships are like this? Let's turn in some detail now to the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. In chapter 6, closing his letter to that church, Paul says, Brothers, that beautiful New Testament word. A word that reminds us that we're all the same here. Like the issues are different. The moralities and the Christian successes are somewhere on a scale. But essentially we are the same. We are, in the words of the Reformation, simultaneously justified and redeemed. Saints and sinners, all of us. Brothers, if anyone is caught in sin. So the context of the discussion that Paul is having with the church now is that someone in the church has done something that they ought not to have done. Now remember, this is a normal part of life. There are no perfect people. We all occasionally behave in ways that are contrary to our core character. And so the word caught in this sentence does not mean caught as in your dad walked into your bedroom and found you watching Miley Cyrus videos. It doesn't have a sense of being discovered doing something naughty. It means caught as in getting stuck. So we're talking here about a person who typically wishes to do the right thing and normally does do the right thing. And then from way out of left field, something from their darker side came up, caught them unawares, and now they're stuck in sin. And I think that at various points in our lives, we all struggle with things that we did not expect to be struggling with. Things that we didn't see coming last year. They're like a barb on a fence, and here we are snagged in a situation. This is what the word caught means. This is the same word that the, the historian Josephus uses to describe what happens to the 10th Roman legion in Palestine when they are caught in a night ambush. They didn't see it coming. So question, looking at your life today, do you see yourself dealing with things, coping with things that you didn't see coming? This is caught in this sentence. And all of us who are trying to follow Jesus best we can and who want to do the right thing, absolutely, we all get taken by surprise sometimes. So that's the discussion. Someone in the church has got caught up in something. And you know what? That something is embarrassing. It is shameful and we do not wish it. Paul says when that happens, you who are spiritual should restore him. Now, the word restore is a beautiful word. This is the word that's used elsewhere in the Gospels to describe what happens to the fishing nets of fishermen um, in the wear and tear of daily use, they become broken and in need of repair. And I think it's a word that describes life for all of us. Can you relate to that? In the living of that life you have, you find yourself being worn and torn and somewhat in need of repair. You ever come to church on a Sunday? There's things at work and things in your family and things in your health and you're worn. 
And you're done. And you're exhausted. And you find yourself in need of repair. This is the quintessential Christian word and I hope the quintessential life point word. Christianity is, is, is sometimes at its deepest and its best when we gather together and in the, in the shared experience of living this filthy, beautiful, amazing, disappointing life, we repair one another and restore one another and encourage one another through it all. And if you're tracking well with Jesus... Your heart will, will go out to the person in need of repair. Remember, the first core value of our church is that no perfect people are allowed. We're not here for the perfect. We're here for the damaged, for the worn, for the torn, and the broken. We are a church. We aspire to be at least of restoration and of life. Paul says here in this sentence, it is your job as a person of faith to do this. It is your job to try to mend, to restore, to encourage those whom life has worn and torn and broken. Alright, that's Christian. And you'll notice also please, that Paul says this is to be done how? Gently. In this sentence, Paul, of course, is talking to people who at the moment are not worn, who are not broken, who are not damaged, who are doing rather well. And when someone is in that particular enjoyable season in life, the tendency, I think, is to obsess in some sort of self-pleasing um, uh, self way about, about how well they themselves are doing about how good their morals happen to be at the moment, how successful everything happens to be at the moment, how, how accurate my rules are and my traditions, or whatever. And in that situation, it's very easy to par parade your good life in the face of someone's disappointing one. And it doesn't help. So the advice here from the Apostle is when you're restoring someone who is caught in sin, please, please, please put your sanctimonious attitude on ice for a moment. Be sympathetic. Papa, don't preach. Just listen. Just listen. Remember what we said in week two of this series. One of the things that most people in this world are looking for is for someone to say, Hey, I see you. I hear you. I understand. The Bible says, cautiously, that as you do this most Christian of things, you are to do so being fully aware of your own humanity. That's why he adds the caveat, watch yourself. For goodness sake, watch yourself. Or you also may be tempted. So applying this then to our subject matter today, what the Apostle is saying that sometimes your relationships take from you more than they give to you. I mean in this context, if your friend has gotten into something that they're trying to get out of, if they are caught in something difficult, my goodness that is draining indeed. Those of you who have had friends caught up in, 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 in horrible addiction situations or, 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 or debt situations or, or horrible situations in their relationships, can attest to, to how draining this has been. I mean, this is a situation where all the conversations are by definition about the situation that they are going through. What else could they be about? And you can help them get through that. That's fine. But, please, watch yourself. Watch yourself firstly because you cannot give yourself away all of the time. Your life unlike the life of the God to whom we pray, is finite. It is, by definition, a limited resource. So keep an eye 
on your emotional and your physical and your spiritual balance sheet. Because if all your relationships are of a sort where you give and never get, you're headed for disaster. So watch yourself. Watch yourself. Secondly, because when you're helping someone through something, it's all too easy to forget that you are capable of going through some things of your own. And as you talk with a person who has succumbed to the vagrancies of life, watch yourself that you do not become so entrenched in how things are presently going for you that you fool yourself into thinking that you yourself are not subject to such vagrancies yourself. Life can turn on the drop of a hat. I'm not even sure that's a saying. But you know what I mean. You never know what a week can bring. You never know what someone can, can, can put on you in a week. You never know. Then he says, Carry each other's burdens. And this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now one of the classic mistakes we all make in this area is to assume that draining people, people who take, take and take, have no role in our lives other than to frustrate us. We think that when we spend two hours being taken by a taker, that's two hours of our lives that we've wasted. And the Bible would suggest otherwise. The Bible would suggest that that selfish, difficult people are sometimes to us a bit like weights in a gym are to us, in that they provide a resistance that actually make us better humans and better Christians. Notice what this sentence does. This sentence links the burdens of other people. And burdens are burdens. Don't sugarcoat it. A burden is a burden. The burdens of other people are linked in this sentence with fulfilling the law of Jesus. What this sentence is saying then is that in those situations where you have to cope with a difficult, draining person who's going through something hard, you have in those moments the opportunity to be all that God intended you to be in life. Wasting an hour of your life being taken by a taker is not always wasting an hour of your life. It's helping them. And helping people is one of the things that makes you better. We are never at our best when we are living for ourselves. Ever. Can you think of a single selfish person you like? Whenever I meet with people... I was about to say, whenever I meet with people after they've passed on... I never meet with people after they've passed on... <laughs> Whenever I meet with the families of people after they've passed on, no one ever says they were amazing because, because of the things they achieved. Or because of the things they spent on themselves. But they do always talk about they were amazing because they gave me this. They created this for me. They spent this on me. It's always what they give, never what they got. We are not at our best when we are for ourselves. But, that said, honestly, sometimes when you've spent an hour of your life being taken by a taker, it does feel like you've wasted an hour of your life, doesn't it? And you feel angry about it. Do you ever feel angry because you feel someone used you for an hour? On the phone or over coffee? Let me give you a tip. People can't take from you what you freely give away. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said at the end, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Now when you watch those movies then about Jesus getting crucified, and you know, you, you're not meant to feel sorry for Jesus. Jesus gave himself away. What seemed like a murder was actually a sacrifice. So the thing to do when you come to, to a situation where you know you're going to get taken is to make the decision to give yourself away. Because people can't take what you've already given. 
People can't steal your time if you've decided ahead of time to give your time away. People can't steal your energy if you've decided ahead of time that you're going to give your energy away. And if you approach it with that sort of generous giving Christian spirit, you'll find that you do more good in that situation and that the situation has less of a negative effect upon you. You empower yourself by giving yourself away. This is the upside down logic of Christian faith. Next sentence. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So getting back to the business of helping someone who's been stuck in sin, um, the point here is that when you do that, you should never get caught up in the preposterous illusion that you are above it all. You should never get caught up in the delusion that bad things won't happen to you just because they haven't happened to you in a while. Try to remember, as you help someone who is going through life's worst, that all you are is one sinner helping another. The damaged encouraging the damaged. The broken helping the broken. And in that regard, he says, <clears throat> each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to anyone else. Never engage with others with a deluded sense of who you are. We in this church are a house of sinners and saints. Not that some are sinners and some are saints. Each of us are in our own bodies sinners and saints. Nothing more, nothing less. Next sentence. Look at this. Sentence for your teenager. For your, for your friend who wants you to do everything for them. This is in the Bible. Each one should carry his own load. So now I'm confused. Is it verse 2 or is it verse 5? Should I help other people with their burdens? Or should those people be responsible for their own burdens? The answer is it's both. There are some things that you can do for people, and there are some things that you can't. And wisdom is knowing the difference. What this is saying is that, friend, you have to check your balance sheet. Because if you're always helping people with things that they should be helping themselves with, before long you're going to need help yourself. So by all means help. But listen. You cannot keep giving and giving and giving and giving and never getting anything back. That's dysfunction. And it never works. I just realized I prepared more than I have time to, to say. So let me wrap it up by giving you some... Let me give you some practical... Slightly funny, but slightly serious advice. But do you know those people in your life who are always hitting you up for a favor? They're always asking you for things. It's always about them, but never about you. Try this. You know, could you take my kids to soccer practice? Could you cover my shift on Tuesday? Those people. You know those people? Those people don't ruin your life. But they're really good at ruining your day. It says in the Bible that each one should carry his own load. The best way to deal with those people is to ask them for things in return. So try this. Hey, uh, would you be able to, to, to help me out? I'm just, I'm just behind. Could you run my kids to soccer practice on Tuesday? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. No problem. Be glad to do that. On Friday... Could you come around to my house and mow my lawn? Because I'm busy. <laughs> no. No, seriously, what's wrong with that? That's quid pro quo. No, no, no. You're asking me to spend two hours of my life driving your kids to soccer practice. I'm happy to do it. I'm a nice guy. And I assume since you're happy to ask me to drive my, your kids to soccer practice... You don't mind coming around to my house and giving an hour of my life and mowing my lawn. What's wrong with that? 
they probably won't come round and mow your lawn. But they probably won't ask, <laughs> ask you to drive your kids to soccer practice again. You're so welcome. <laughs> we should go around with the offering basket again, because that's worth double, right? <laughs> okay. Now some people, some people, let me say this sensitively, You know, I'm not a, 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 a shrink or anything. I, I mean, I need one, but I'm not one. <laughs> um, but I know enough to know that some people are just narcissists. Okay. They're, they're not out to hurt you. But they just don't care about you. The only care those people have for you is the extent to which you are willing to be an audience for their ongoing narcissism and self-obsession. That's it. That's the only interest they have in your life. Being an audience. Being an ear. Their motto is enough about you, let's talk about me. And while you're talking about something in your life, they're not listening, they're just thinking about what they're going to tell you next about their life. Mostly they're probably not bad people. Being a narcissist isn't bad. Those two don't equate. But they just don't care about you. They only care about themselves. So if you're in a relationship with these people, that's fine. Just understand it's never going to be 50-50. Some people um, actually... Um, about We know that about 1 in 100 people are psychopaths. Uh, a psychopath, uh, remember we spoke in week two of this series about a bit of the brain that allows us to mirror other people and is responsible for empathy and feeling what others are going through. Well, one in a hundred people don't have that bit of their brain. Some of them are in prison and some of them are running major corporations. Um, so if you're, if you're in a relationship with one of those people, run. Because there's nothing, there's nothing you can do. That's just the way it is. Um, so, when he says to the church, each one should carry their own burdens, what do you think he wants people in the church to understand? Why, why say that to people? Why drum that so hard into their ears? It's simple, I think. He wants each individual to know that each individual, having said what we've said about our shared life, having said what we've said about our shared experience of being worn and damaged by life and in need of repair and in needing one another for that repair, having said all of that, at the end of the day, each person is fundamentally responsible for their own life, for their own happiness, for their own everything. Is this something that we can agree upon? Your happiness is not someone else's job. It's your job. Your bills are not someone else's responsibility. They're your responsibility. Some of the situations that you're going through, of course you need help. Of course you need a, a friendly ear. But fundamentally, nonetheless, at the end of the day, it comes down to you. And what you're going to do and how you're going to fix it. Your life is your own and you're responsible for it. And that way I think happiness lies. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Let me pray before we go. Heavenly Father, we
Father, I pray that I pray that you will do that thing that you are uniquely able to do. I speak of the damage, of the wear, of the tear, of the exhaustion, of the frustration, of the fear, of the guilt, of the shame that each one of us brought with us to church this morning. All of those things that make life so much less than you would have had it be. I speak of all that. And I pray for you to bring peace, to bring healing, to bring restoration, to bring forgiveness, to bring hope, to bring light and life where things have been dark for far too long. I pray this for each head bowed. For each family member not here this morning. For each person we love. And for each person with whom we struggle. Work in our lives. I ask. Through Christ our good Lord. Amen.